I want to begin by saying thank you to the people of Mount Albert. It is my honour to represent you and serve you all as your Member of Parliament. Helen Clark will be remembered as one of New Zealand's great Prime Ministers. But on the campaign trail I became aware of another side of her political life. 28 years serving as a devoted electorate MP, respected by Mount Albert residents across the political spectrum. The Mount Albert electorate is both young and old. 40% of its people were born outside of New Zealand and it's been an entry point for many new New Zealanders and home for an extraordinary diversity of people, Pacific Islanders, Indians, Chinese, Somalis, Sri Lankans and many others. One of those was a teenager who introduced himself to me as a Tampa boy. He was a refugee off the Tampa, stopped from landing in Australia, stranded in the Indian Ocean. Until the Labour government, in the face of negative opinion polls, opened the door for them to come to New Zealand. We did what was right. And now we can feel very justified. His English is fluent, he's studying at AUT, and he's so very proud to be a New Zealander. He and so many others are shaping the future face of New Zealand, attracted here by hope and opportunity, as were our ancestors. They are emblematic of our country's history. I'm a passionate New Zealander with deep roots in Auckland and this country. But I also lived and worked in some of the countries that our migrants have come from. So I see New Zealand through a slightly different lens. What we have is all too rare in this world. It feels very right to be here. Just a few weeks ago, I was sitting in a sandbagged room in Baghdad, agonising about whether to put my name forward to stand in Mount Albert. And it was a tough decision. I was overseeing the UN's effort to reconstruct Iraq, supporting people who had suffered terribly for over 30 years. So I did what I've often done, spoke at length with my wife, my family and my close friends. Some argued against it. What are you thinking? They asked. You've got a family, a successful career. Why jettison all that for a life in politics? <laughs> Their view reflects the same frustration I hear in Mount Albert that our politics is not listening or responsive to people. My decision ultimately came down to believing that I can make a real and positive difference. Most of my life has been spent in war zones and famines in other parts of the world. And in those jobs I've been bombed, shelled and shot at. And I've been told that's probably quite good training for Parliament. <laughs> Iraq, Gaza, Rwanda, Somalia, Sri Lanka and others working for the United Nations and Save the Children. These are the places where you confront the very worst of the world and I've sat and negotiated with people who orchestrated destu destruction and misery. But it's also where you meet the best. And I've had the great fortune and privilege to work alongside people whose daily lives are routinely heroic. These people and their dozens, hundreds of others, I'm proud to say, have been part of my life, have inspired me, <clears throat> each in their own way, fighting to make a difference in their family and their community. Against injustice, against the system, weighted to deny people a fair go. They are a reminder to me that we can all make a difference. I see that same spirit in New Zealand. Those values of justice, fairness and opportunity are ingrained with our, within our collective DNA. It's demonstrated in the many, many people who contribute selflessly to their communities. And this is a great country of wondrous landscapes, of proud achievements. We've, made significant, we've had significant moments of nation building our stand on nuclear ships, New Zealand's war of independence, it's been called. Personal to me because it was my political awakening. We took a brave decision on the Iraq war and the right one. We should exult in this independence and be proud to project our values. Be confident then to become an independent country, reject the need for another nation's flag in the corner of our own. <laughs> Norway, with a similar population, has been at the forefront of international peace efforts. We can do the same. I've seen our armed forces and police overseas, and they are without equal. Not just for their professionalism, but more importantly, for the values and attitude they hold. 
for their ingrained sense of fair play and justice part of our New Zealand character. We have the can-do attitude. We need the vision. Let's be bold. Let's see what's possible. Many times when I was in far-flung places, I was sustained by the thoughts of our beaches, our bush, our mountains, and our lakes. Our deep love of the landscape is part of our shared cultural identity as New Zealanders, no matter where we came from. It motivated me to study environmental management, and it led me to work for the Tainui Trust Board. That experience forced me to confront Ropatu, the confiscation of Maori land in Tonga, an injustice just as real in the hearts of those I met on the Waikato Marae as what I later encountered in conflicts throughout the world. Through the Waitangi Tribunal, we are redressing this legacy and recasting the story, but we still have a way to go. Addressing tribal rights has yet to fully translate into better education, health and prison statistics for Māori. This is perhaps our biggest challenge as a country. It is a responsibility that belongs to us all, but mostly for Māori to chart and shape their own destiny. We trade on our clean, green image. My worry is that our actions are falling short of our talk. We can be leaders. It's not only good for New Zealand business, it's good for our children and essential for the planet. New Zealand was built on individual initiative, hard work, strong businesses, a farming backbone and the efficiency of a free market. But we're not a collection of individuals. We're all in it together and everybody needs a fair go at opportunity. We do need to look after one another. Our country was also built on that. We can't allow our kids and unemployed to drop out and then shut the door on their opportunities to re-engage. It's not only a tragic waste for the individuals concerned, it's a collective failing and ultimately we all lose. We face tough times. Poverty, unemployment and uncertainty are on the rise. Now is not the time to allow our ambitions to stagnate either as a people or as a nation. Take research and development. New Zealanders are natural innovators. Our scientists and entrepreneurs are the people who will chart our future prosperity. We can't afford to be stingy with them. Now is the time to boost opportunities and to be bold. I'm a proud member of the Labour Party, a party of opportunity, a party responsible for most of the key milestones in our country's development and a party for our future. I've spoken about where I've come from and what I stand for. I'm here to listen, to make a difference, to create opportunity, to reach out to what's possible. I'm told that what you say here will come back to haunt you. I hope it does. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa.